Your Excellencies, most venerable religious representatives, ladies and gentlemen, it is a very, very great honor for me to be here in front of you and to give you a presentation how His Majesty, late King Umipula Dulya Day of Thailand, was also somebody who encouraged uh, in a most amazing way the digital propagation of Buddhism. And if I begin my presentation uh, with a sad picture at the occasion, with a picture of a Buddha statue covered by the ashes of Mount Merapi after the volcanic eruption in Indonesia, it is to remind us that in our world, uh, we are so worried at the moment about climate change, about physical pollution, but that in reality what we should be much more worried about is the mental pollution. Mental pollution is the real problem of our world, and there's probably no better, better path than the Buddhist path to work against that towards an ecology of the mind, an ecology which takes care of how we perceive things, not only how we do them, but how, according to Buddhist teachings, we perceive and we conceive our thoughts and our actions, because action is only coming after we perceive them in our inner thing, a way towards psychoecology. The two projects uh, I'm going to talk to you about um, have originated in Thailand. Nobody was more preoccupied about environment than His Majesty the King. So it's in his honor that I want uh, to dedicate him today a presentation of these two projects, namely the visualization of Wat Prakeo, the Temple of the Emerald Buddha, uh, which is in Bangkok in the Royal Palace, and the second project, uh, the Borobudur, uh, which is the biggest Buddhist temple, which is in Java in Indonesia. Uh, the first project uh, began around 1996, when it was called uh, to Thailand to see how could Dhamma be translated into the modern uh, language of multimedia. The second project was an almost logical sequel to it, which was to go to Indonesia and see how the Borobudur, who is basically almost has the design of a computer chip which was designed about a thousand years ago, could convey the Dhamma uh, message to modern age. But it really all began here at UNESCO uh, when in 1990, 1991, UNESCO undertook, under the guidance of A.G. Hattori, uh, the uh, expedition of the Silk Roads of the Sea. And when I had the honor to be part of this expedition, and one of our stations was Bangkok, uh, the Emerald Buddha Temple, Wat Prakeo. Now, Wat Prakeo, uh, for those who have not seen it, is an amazing temple. It's basically the Far Eastern equivalent of the Sixteen Chapel. It's a temple uh, which is covered on all four sides by huge mural paintings, frescoes which date, uh, which date back to the uh, late 18th century. They were created about the same time as the French Revolution shook Europe. And altogether, uh, these murals cover about 1,700 square meters. When I uh, stood the first time in front of these murals, I was totally overwhelmed and I had no idea really what I was looking at uh, because the whole uh, wall is basically uh, one continuous 
flow of images which are not separated. They are basically the uh, uh, south wall which we are looking at and the north wall which we are looking at now. One huge mural and it was only after a high-ranking uh, official of the court in Thailand, Tan uh, Puying Putri, uh, started to explain to me that I started to understand what I'm looking at. And what I was looking at was the life of Lord Buddha, the way from his birth to his passing to Paranivana, how he had basically uh, undergone this huge transformation from a prince who gave up uh, all his riches, all his wealth on the search for the profound uh, reality, uh, uh, which are the questions why are things like uh, old age, death, uh, malady in our life. He gave up all his wealth, his kingdom, and became uh, uh, a monk, an ascetic, wandering for many years through the wilderness until he attained, obtained uh, enlightenment. And uh, what I re realized in the brink of a moment was, wow, here on this wall, everything is said. And uh, we, Westerners, we stand in front of that. We have no idea how illiterate are we about this. And what suddenly fell together in my mind was how if we combine the image language which has been used 200 years ago with the power of modern multimedia to convey this life, the teachings, the insights of Lord Buddha to bring them to the new illiterates uh, uh, of our world, the people who don't know about Buddhism, about the message of the Buddha, and how can we uh, put these two uh, together? Um, in the Middle Ages in Europe, uh, we used a technique which was called uh, the Bible for the poor. Many people didn't know how to read at that time, and therefore the Bible, were, the Bible was illustrated. Same technique was used over and over in the Far East, and uh, therefore, we have all these fantastic renditions of Lord Buddha's life and of his parable in visuals. But, how, um, but there was one major obstacle actually doing this. Uh, never, never a camera had been allowed into Wat Prakeo in the Emerald Buddha Temple. It is such a sacred place that it was just unthinkable uh, that the camera would ever have been allowed. And that uh, is where His Majesty the King came in because it needed a God King, basically, to give the permission for cameras for the, ever, uh, for the first time ever, and probably for the last time ever, uh, to enter Wat Prakeo. And His Majesty gave the permission, and that's how this work started. Uh, to better understand uh, why His uh, Majesty may have given uh, his permission is to look on his deep, profoundly and deeply uh, Buddhist background. He went into monkhood at a very early age, as we heard today. But a second explanation is also uh, the lifelong uh, relationship he had with Par Chalom uh, who was later to become the Supreme Patriarch of Thailand under the name of Somdet Pranyana Samvara, who was a man who believed very deeply and very profoundly into using new media, always the newest media, into propagating and promoting Buddhism. His Majesty himself was deeply interested in technology, from radio technologies uh, to the newest models of computers. And already two years after the first Mac had ever appeared on the market, we can see a Mac sitting on his uh, desktop. And he was very uh, actively involved in promoting uh, Buddhism. He presided over Buddhsir, which was the Buddhist scripture information retrieval project search engine enabling scholars to search the entire corpus of the Buddhist canon, the Tipitaka, 
both in Thai and Pali language. But more importantly, and most importantly, there was maybe uh, the influence which was exerted on His Majesty the King by his mother, uh, who is called uh, by the Thai people Ma Fa Luang, uh, a mother who descended from the sky because she, because she used to go to the poor regions of the country by helicopter to alleviate the poverty and to study the problems. And Princess Mother, as she was called, had um, in 1967 demanded the monks to publish a little booklet which was called What Did the Buddha Teach? which is the name of our production. And it was meant for diplomats of Thailand, for representatives uh, of a Thai diplomatic corps abroad, and for students abroad, uh, to be able to concisely give to foreigners a small idea of what Buddhism was about. A little booklet of a few pages, uh, I think altogether it was 14 pages, and I think it is quite amazing to see what became out of this little booklet of 14 pages when it was turned into a multimedia project, which takes you probably a couple of weeks to look at in details if you look at all the ramifications. I'm just going to guide you in a few minutes uh, through some examples. Uh, the real challenge of the whole thing not being to re-narrate and animate what was on the walls, but to start to translate Buddhist concepts uh, into mind maps, into roadmaps of Buddhism, uh, to translate Buddhist concepts into something which would be visually transferable to young people who don't read anymore, who love to flip very quickly the media, who uh, get uh, carried away by music, by central experience, by edutainment, and that was the main challenge. And um, the other challenge was that I wanted to link every single uh, part of the murals to the original locations in India. So we traveled 6,000 kilometers uh, to India on the footsteps of the Buddha uh, to go to all the sacred places to give people an idea of where this all happened. Multimedially speaking, um, the basic concepts, the Four Noble Truths, the Noble Eightfold Path, were translated, you're going to see it in a second, uh, into animations, uh, which then could be individually called up by the viewer, by the student, uh, as they use this application. Today we speak about applications, at that time the word was not even known. Even complex, uh, um, uh, concepts like the wheel of becoming uh, dependent origination were translated into uh, visuals and into visuals which allow you to travel inside a world and become part of it. And uh, I'm going to pass quickly through that because we see it in a moment uh, in animation. The project took four years to be completed and was presented to the public in the year 2000. So with all this, let me please now go to the live demonstration uh, of this uh, project and show you how at that time we had translated it into multimedia reality. So. We can go back to the projection. This is the main menu, and it is structured uh, according uh, to the triple gem uh, into, at the time it was CD-ROMs, there was not even DVDs around, into Buddha, Dhamma, and Sangha. And let me go right into the first disc. Once in an eon, a Buddha appears in our world, an enlightened one. Using his loving compassion to bestow on us the Dharma, the profound knowledge of how to overcome all suffering. It was thus that in the 6th century BC appeared Sakyamuni, 
born as Prince Siddhartha of the Sakya clan in northern India, who, after immense struggles, was destined to reach enlightenment and to discover the path leading to a cessation of the endless revolutions of the wheel of becoming, Samsara. So from this main menu, we can go right away into uh, the sub-menu in the uh, temple. And as I said before, the temple of the Emerald Buddha is uh, quite an amazing place. And we used at that time state-of-the-art technology of uh, panoramic, of interactive panorama, which allows you to go basically anywhere you want uh, and look around at your own guys into the temple. Today, this is very normal uh, technology, but consider that this was all done about 40, 17 years ago. Emerald Buddha in the Grand Palace Bangkok. Another way to navigate uh, these walls into uh, more detail is to scroll and to basically, uh, as you can see, as I'm uh, going with the cursor over the different scenes, it will always tell you on top of the screen which scene you are currently viewing, which part of the, which episode of the life of the Buddha. If we look here, for instance, at the crossing of the Anoma River, we just click it and we go right away uh, to this episode of the Buddha crossing Anoma River. Vast trains of celestial beings attended Siddhartha on his nocturnal ride. It is said that the deities bore 60,000 torches in front of and on each side of him, and that flowers and garlands rained down. In this glorious state, Siddhartha crossed three kingdoms, Kapilowatu, Sawati, and Vesali, in a single night before he reached the river Anoma. Uh, so you can see, you can go in instantly, basically, to any place in the life of Lord Buddha. And let's for a moment begin at the very uh, beginning uh, with uh, the conditions which make uh, uh, the life, uh, the five conditions which are uh, needed to be met before a Buddha comes to the world. And there is uh, all this background knowledge which you can access starting from each part of the huge murals. You can go more and more and more in depth, ultimately linking it to the original scriptures. And so, um, uh, as I said, you can also go to the geographical background, for instance, uh, to the country of India, and then go and follow the footsteps of Lord Buddha and go to the different places from where he was born to where he passed away, passing by all the holy sites of Buddhism. And uh, we go, for instance, here to Lumpini, where uh, Lord Buddha was born. And uh, once you are there, you will have the possibility to uh, again have a look around and then just explore by your own uh, what the place may have looked actually 2,000 years ago when Lord Buddha was himself moving onto those places. So you can go around, get more uh, in detail uh, descriptions. I'll skip uh, many of the details because, oops, okay. <laughs> and you can also backward link the whole thing. That means from any location in India, you can go back and see what happened uh, at this place by going back on the wall and uh, basically experience uh, back in Wat Prakeo the event uh, which was typical for uh, and which was related to that very point in, uh, uh, in India. So, can we go up with this? The sound? Adorning the trees from their trunks to their tips were bunches of flowers blooming and shedding fragrant petals. Standing under one such majestic tree, 
Mahamaya desired to pluck a sprig from the branches. As soon as she conceived this thought, the tree bent down so she could pick the sprig as she wished. At that moment, as she grasped the sprig, her labor commenced. Her attendants surrounded her with curtains, and with her face turned to the east, she delivered her son without pain. Um, I'm going back. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm jumping, obviously, because uh, this is made to enjoy, uh, really, uh, like a movie, and you can see. Thank you so much. Appreciate very much. Thank you. Um, but uh, we have to go on on our journey. And following the south wall, um, the last uh, scene on the south wall is the enlightenment of Lord Buddha under uh, the Bodhi tree. And then in all Thai temples, what is very typical, we go uh, to the east wall, uh, which is dedicated actually to the night uh, of enlightenment. And so we decided to give an entire uh, disc uh, to the east wall uh, because that's when really the insights of Lord Buddha and the teaching uh, begins uh, to, to come in his life. And that's what we wanted to convey with the second disc, with Dhamma. Amid the countless worlds which constitute all the universes, appears once in an age a Buddha, an enlightened one, who uses his boundless compassion to alleviate the pain of all beings. He does so through setting in motion the wheel of law by preaching the Dharma. This enables those trapped in samsara, the eternal cycle of becoming, to escape from their karmic round of reincarnations and to reach ultimate deliverance. So again here we have a sort of sub-menu which will guide us this time through the teaching of Lord Buddha. And uh, uh, here just a short view on uh, this huge wall, the east wall of uh, Wat Perkeo. And you see on the right side how big this mural is compared to a living person. This little monk is uh, life-size, so you can have an idea of how huge this uh, wall is. But uh, let's go into uh, uh, the Dhamma and have an uh, idea about the basic ideas of Lord Buddha. The essence of the entire Buddhist teaching lies in the Four Noble Truths. And again from here you have the possibility to go more and more into depths uh, in an interactive way and to explore, explore yourself interactively. What is the noble eightfold path? What are the, where is all the suffering coming from? How can it be diluted? Uh, let me take you uh, to the noble truth of the origin of suffering. It lies the in the eternal circle. Okay, we can put the sound. The interdependence and interrelation of all things in the form of a continuum based on the law of cause and effect. The functioning of the principle of dependent origination applies to all things, both physical and mental, and expresses itself through a number of natural laws. So here uh, we are dealing with some rather complicated concepts, and in order to make them uh, more understandable, especially also for young people, we go into animation to explain how the mechanics of dependent uh, origination work. The process of origination of all suffering, corresponding to the second noble truth, 
can be understood as a chain reaction of cause and effect. If the twelve constituting factors of dependent origination are linked in a forward mode. With ignorance as condition, volitional impulses arise. These lead to consciousness, which conditions name and form. With name and form as condition, the six sense bases arise. But uh, what is ignorance? In order to make uh, spectators who use this interactive program to better understand these different stages, we created an exper uh, experience world where we fly people actually into uh, this kind of uh, experience world. So, what is ignorance? We can go in each one of these worlds and we can experience the arising and the cessation by going in three dimensions around and experience all these different stages. So, what is ex uh, ignorance? Ignorance is compared to three stains or defilements which taint the mind, which in its original purity is similar to an immaculate white piece of cloth. Ignorance is the failure to see things as they are or to realize the nature of reality. It obscures the mind and prevents us from achieving freedom. So the way out of each one of these stages is the Noble Eightfold Path. And what is the way leading to the cessation of it? Ignorance. It is simply the Noble Eightfold Path, namely right view, right thought, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration. And obviously you can go into each one of these paths and go more and more into depths and explore it. Um, we can go into more complicated uh, things, which is consciousness, a very fascinating uh, concept, uh, which is especially uh, fascinating modern scientists and it's very interesting how 2000 years ago Lord Buddha started to explain the concept of consciousness. And we can enter this experience world again and see consciousness. What is consciousness? See, the, Bu the Buddha had a very interesting interpretation of what he called, the, uh, what we would call today, the chemistry of the mind. The Dhamma details those mental factors whose subtle combinations constitute the various states of consciousness. And we can go into all uh, these details of the Abhidhamma, which is the higher teachings of Buddha, and do our own research about the combination of the chemistry of the mind and then there are uh, ta ta tables which are, have been established by Buddhist scholars which show you all these different elements, how they work together. Well, this just is an idea how far in depth uh, we can go. We can go to the Tipitaka. Uh, let's have a quick look at the last disc, at the Sangha, uh, which is, after all, uh, why we are here, because the Sangha is propagating the teaching of Lord Buddha. And the whole north wall of Wat Prakeo is dedicated 
to how he founded the, uh, the Sangha, how he came even to the conclusion how to uh, and uh, how to and why uh, to promote his insights, which in the beginning he believed were much too complicated. Buddha was not inclined, Lord Buddha was not inclined in the beginning to share his insights because he felt much too complicated. I will not be able to bring that across. And then uh, he used this beautiful metaphor of the lotus uh, to see, uh, to, see uh, to show how uh, the wisdom which uh, he had insight to could be promoted at different levels. Let me go into the uh, north wall and show you this very insight he had about this. The Buddha decided to preach the Dharma after compassionately surveying the world of sentient beings. He saw that some beings have little dust in their eyes, while others have much dust, that some beings have keen faculties, while others have dull faculties. They can be compared to the different ways that lotuses grow in a pond. Some are like lotuses that do not rise out of the mud at the bottom of the pond, where they are eaten by turtles and fish. Some are like lotuses that do not reach the water's surface. Some are like lotuses that float on the surface of the water. Some are like lotuses that rise above the water's surface and bloom untouched by mud or water. Just so, different beings have different capacities to understand the Buddha's teaching. Well, as a last impression, I mean, there are many wonderful uh, episodes on these walls, and one big dispute we had were all these miracles the Buddha did. Modern scientists say, hey, why do we need miracles? We can all explain this uh, psychologically and with science. But the beauty to co convey basically what the Buddha had to say also to simple people was uh, to go always along with his miracles. So many of the miracles uh, were visualized. I, I cannot go into details. I'll finish the first part of the demonstration with Lord Buddha's entering of para, uh, para Nirvana. And then we'll have to pass to the second uh, to Borobudur. Arriving in Uxinara, the Buddha ordered Ananda to enter the city and inform the Malas of the Tathagata's impending death. Then, he addressed his disciples. If, O oh disciples, there be any doubt as to the Buddha, or the Dharma, or the Sangha, or the path, or the method, question me, and repent not afterwards thinking we were face to face with the teacher, yet we were not able to question the Exalted One in His presence. When He spoke thus, the disciples were silent. Lastly, just to reload one second. The Buddha addressed the disciples and gave his final exhortation. Behold, O oh disciples, I exhort you. Subject to change are all component things. Strive on with diligence. The Buddha attained then the final absorption. Emerging from it, he attained in order the second, third, and fourth absorptions. Then he reached the realm of the infinity of space. Emerging from it, he attained the realm of infinity of consciousness. And from there, the realm of neither perception 
no non-perception. Emerging from it, he attained the cessation of perception and sensation. Entered one more time each of these states, and then finally entered Paranirvana. Let me come to the second part. Uh, ten years uh, after this project, uh, the uh, government of Indonesia approached me uh, in order to uh, see how we could bring the Borobudur, which is considered the largest Buddhist temple, into the modern world to cyberspace. Now, here we are talking of a completely uh, different ball game, because uh, the Borobudur as opposed to the temple in Thailand, which is murals, the Borobudur is a three-dimensional uh, structure. And uh, those of you uh, who know the Borobudur know that it's a very large stupa, uh, which is supposed to be explored by 10 circumnavigations, which will bring you slow, slowly and closer and closer to illumination into uh, wise uh, wisdom and complete insight. So the Borobudur is covered with 1,460 bar reliefs, uh, which uh, constitute a kind of a cross section through all schools of Buddhism. That's the interesting uh, part of the Borobudur. It's not only uh, Theravada Buddhism, it's a cross section through all schools of Buddhism. And when you look at the scheme uh, from top on the, uh, on the Borobudur, you may be reminded of a computer chip. And that was the navigational approach I took with this project. I said, here we have the wisdom, the entire wisdom of Buddhism, which has been encoded about a thousand years ago into uh, something which is uh, really a mind map of uh, Buddhism. The difference between Wat Perkeo uh, and Borobudur is in uh, Wat Perkeo we have rather a road map, while in Borobudur we have a mind map of Buddhism, uh, which allows us to go much more in depth. And also we are dealing with a three-dimensional uh, structure. Here the same scene which you have seen before, the crossing of the Anoma River, one time in painting and one time uh, shown as uh, sculpture. But the really amazing thing is, as I mentioned, this kind of top view uh, of the Borobudur, which we have transformed into a map. I'm going to show you that in a second in live, uh, live where you can access any uh, part of the Buddha's life, any part of the concepts as well uh, of uh, Theravada Buddhism, as of Mahayana Buddhism, as of Th uh, Vajrayana Tibetan uh, Buddhism from one uh, vantage point and immediately. Uh, obviously, we had to do with much more complicated uh, recording uh, uh, demands, and so we co started by constructing a three-dimensional uh, uh, model of the Borobudur, which would allow us to navigate in time and space simultaneously. And one of the things I wanted to preserve was this amazing uh, view of all these panoramas. In order to do this, we did 400 uh, uh, panoramas, uh, and it took a whole year just to took these 400 shots, and you will see why in a second, uh, why we choose this. We obviously refer to much more complicated diagrams, but again, the idea was to provide insight uh, into uh, what Buddhism has to convey from the simplest level to the most complicated level. That's why the project was called uh, PASS, PASS in the plural, uh, plural Borobudur, Borobudur path to enlightenment. Here you see some of the complexities which will then occur in Mahayana Buddhism, which are quite complicated. Um, I'll pass on uh, that one. Um, uh, just to show the difference how you treat 
painting and sculpture, one in full 3D animation, the other one just by overlayering and, and, and panning. So it was a much, much more complicated, obviously also a much, much more expensive production to do this. We also spent four years on doing this. Uh, and here, uh, again, a view at the basic concept of the Borobudur uh, as a computer chip. And you see uh, really this parallel, parallel between the aerial view on the left side and uh, the structural view on the right side. The whole uh, temple could really be seen as a computer chip in which the wisdom and the compassion of the old kings of Java, the Buddhist kings of Java and of Indonesia, what is today Indonesia, were con conveyed and carved into stone. Um, when it comes to Mahayana um, Buddhism, it also gets very, very complicated because there's this concept of the multiple uh, innumerable Buddhist universes uh, as they are exposed in certain key sutras of Mahayana. And in order to visualize that and give, again, a sensual experience of the whole thing, we, uh, we occurred to, um, and we, we used very, very complex uh, 3D modeling. Uh, for this one shot, we constructed 6,000 different Buddha worlds, and it took just for a shot of three minutes, uh, six months to render, just to give you an idea of how complex uh, this one scene is. So this was all uh, modeled in 3D. And without further ado, let me go into the live uh, presentation of Borobudur, Path to Enlightenment. And uh, here we go. There are Buddhas as innumerable as grains of sand in the Ganges. This is the story of one of them, Siddhartha Gautama Buddha, the historical Buddha, also known as Shakyamuni, as it is depicted on the walls of the Borobudur Temple in central Java, Indonesia. The largest Buddhist temple Let me uh, begin uh, with a short introduction. Mm -hmm. Again, as I said, there are multiple paths. And this program can be used the same way by some Western tourist who wants just to spend a half hour to get a quick overview, as by a Buddhist scholar who can spend literally, and I'm not exaggerating, four weeks on this program to go into all the ramifications and details of the program. But let me start with an interesting modern myth by which uh, Indonesians like to explain uh, the role of Borobudur. Legend has it that Neil Armstrong, when he set foot on the moon, spotted a strange glow emanating from a specific area on distant planet Earth. Upon closer examination, the area from where this light came from proved to be located in Southeast Asia, in Indonesia, in Central Java, from a sacred place called the Borobudur. An ancient site plunged into a veil of unsolved mysteries. An area of convergence of ancient wisdom and modern scientific insight. A place so holy that it was singled out as one of the most sanctified spots on Earth. The Borobudur. A place where man meets the divine within himself. So, how to not navigate a structure as complex as the Borobudur? Well, there are many ways uh, to navigate it. And 
as I mentioned before, the first way uh, is a three-dimensional model, which we can turn around in any uh, direction. And as you will see, uh, there are many little entry points here, and each one of these monks uh, uh, projects us directly to one of the galleries of the Borobudur. And here you have the possibility, again, yourself to explore in great detail, uh, going up and down and going uh, into every detail, uh, the possibilities uh, which are given by this visual language in which uh, the Borobudur was originally uh, conceived. And one thing which you may maybe notice is the almost perfect illumination which you have. You don't see any shadows. Well, let me tell you, in reality, this is not the place. If you would go in reality on the place, uh, in winter, this side would be illuminated, in summer, this side would be illuminated, and that's why we took for each of the panoramics a full year. We sent the team uh, every uh, season back on the temple to have perfect illumination of all the panels, because otherwise we wouldn't see the details. Also, we have a little map on the right side at the bottom, and the red arrow tells you always where you are, so you don't uh, lose uh, your orientation on the temple, because that's very easy, especially when you walk on it. And uh, you can also kind of progress and go into uh, the different panels and look at them. And uh, sorry, I wanted to go to another one here. Uh, and uh, explore, again, the different uh, episodes of the world, uh, of the life of Lord Buddha. And here, as a comparison, uh, before I showed you the crossing of the Anoma River uh, in painting, uh, here what we have done with the new possibilities of 3D and of selective uh, selecting of the different scenes uh, with the new technologies which became available in the meantime. Now that midnight has arrived, the hour of the Bodhisattva's great departure has finally come. Scores of heavenly beings appear in order to escort the Bodhisattva. They place the hooves of his horse, Kantaka, on spotless lotuses and lift them in the air, preventing them from making any noise. They open the heavily guarded city gates and they lead him in triumph out of the city, which has fallen into a deep sleep. Vast trains of celestial beings attend Siddhartha on his nocturnal ride. It is said that the deities bore 80,000 torches in front and on each side of him when he crossed the Niranjana River. So you can see the progression in media technology over 10 years from when we did the first project uh, to the next project. But let's go back uh, to the main menu because now I have shown you the three-dimensional approach. There is also a map approach. If we click here, uh, the whole thing uh, transforms into a map. And um, as you can see, when I'm passing with the arrow, you can access every single of the 1,400 uh, uh, panels of the Borobudur just from uh, crossing with your cursor over the map. So from this one menu, we can really access 1,400 different points. I think it's one of the richest interactive menus which has ever uh, been made. Yeah. And let's see uh, again from here. Uh, you, you have the possibility to go into each one of the panels and obviously to animate it. Here we are uh, in what the Thai temples uh, depict in the east wall the night of enlightenment, the temptation of great Mara in animation. 
In an ultimate attempt to prevent Shakyamuni from reaching enlightenment, Mara, the great evil one, unleashes his hordes of demons in a formidable assault against Shakyamuni, who sits meditating under the Bodhi tree. They harass the silently meditating Buddha with a rain of arrows, but as these arrows descend on Shakyamuni, they turn into a shower of flowers. Shakyamuni reacts by touching the earth with his right hand, calling upon Mother Earth to come to his help by testifying on his behalf to the innumerable water sacrifices he has accumulated during his present and past lifetimes. See, and the beauty of it is all done with original elements. I mean, there's no drawings, there's no comics technique. We only use pictural elements which were originally used by uh, the artists uh, either 200 or either 1,000 years ago. So uh, there is a certain integrity uh, by which I did not want to impose kind of modern comics views on the whole thing, but really use traditional Buddhist art uh, to convey the whole thing. Uh, another uh, way to navigate this very complex temple is to just scroll over the different terraces and here you can go from terrace to terrace and again go your own way and explore the different uh, uh, segments of the temple. You can do this in the film form. There's a DVD which comes along. This is, for instance, in the beginning, uh, the life of the Buddha, uh, when um, Siddhartha, just after leaving home, goes into his ascetic life. The ascetic Gautama, as the Bodhisattva calls himself now, has to adapt to an entirely new lifestyle, erring alone in the wilderness. Six years of wandering and of ascetic practices and austerities lie ahead of him. It will be a learning process during which we will experience increasing physical endurance up to the point of complete self-mortification. But what uh, is uh, the overall structure about? Let me give you a short insight uh, from one of the many submenus into uh, the structure of the Borobudur and how it could be read, as I said, as a computer chip. Various attempts of interpretation have been undertaken to explain the function of the Borobudur, ranging from the representation of the holy mountain of Buddhism, Mount Meru, to being a giant stupa. However, the combination of a mandala-like layout with an extremely rich visual content which ranges from historical narratives to initiation formulas and meditative instructions, all clad in the dramatic form of encounters between man and the divine, leads us to assume that a much more ambitious plan was pursued with the construction of the Borobudur. Situated at the intersection between religious spirituality, psychology, and information transfer technology at an early stage, the Borobudur can be considered from a present vantage point as the attempt to be a comprehensive blueprint, a set of instructions conceived to enable access to a higher self, which encompasses the Buddhist ideals of renunciation and universal compassion. Modern computational concepts such as random access memory are built into the many layers of this mnemonic palace with its almost 2,000 randomly accessible memorizers in the form of carved stone panels which remind us in their layout of a highly integrated circuit, a computer chip. And uh, again, if we want uh, to go into all these concepts. The sacred geometry of the Borobudur Mandala is laid out in such a way that one could easily use it as a teaching tool for the three of the fundamental pillars of the Buddhist belief system. So the Four Noble Truths. I will not bore you by uh, going again into the details, but 
uh, again from here you can uh, explore um, the Four Noble Truths, the Eightfold Path, uh, the different segments of dependent origination. So the teaching tool uh, of the quintessence of what Buddhism stands for is also obviously contained in this mind map. Now, many people are puzzled uh, by the uh, question, uh, what is really the difference between Theravada and Mahayana Buddhism? And uh, just to answer this question, which is so often asked, we can begin to access the second gallery of the Borobudur. Accessing the second gallery, we suddenly enter a completely different realm. The presence of the historical Buddha, Shakyamuni, is not any longer a physical one, but one represented by his preaching of a key sutra of the new school of Mahayana Buddhism, which has been attributed to him posthumously. The Avatamsaka, or Flower Garland Sutra, whose last chapter, the Gandavyur, becomes the dominant theme of the remaining three galleries. Yet, in one of these panels, the Buddha is conspicuously absent among his listeners, a clear hint for those who have no ears to hear or no eyes to see that they could miss the essence of the new doctrine, Mahayana, or the great vehicle, which centers its attention on reaching bodhisattvahood, the ideal of self-denying, ultimate compassion. Ten panels showing the Buddha preaching among large gatherings of disciples and celestial beings, possibly alluding to the five times ten steps it takes to master the five ranks of bodhisattvahood, or the ten vows of Samantabhadra, by which the ascent to the top of the galleries will be concluded, form the prelude to the unfolding further story. It is to the quest for this enlightening ideal that all the remaining reliefs are dedicated, in the guise of the spiritual quest of a young man named Sadhana, who will have to encounter 53 teachers before he can fulfill his search for a higher inner self. Now, this is a very fascinating aspect of uh, uh, the Borobudur because it goes this one step further. It takes a young man who could be anybody, any young man today, and it takes him to this uh, experience of meeting 53 different teachers who come from all walks of life. They are kings, they are monks, but they are also prostitutes. They are uh, businessmen, they are children. Uh, all these different facets contribute to bring Sudana uh, to the inside and to enlightenment. Unfortunately, my time is not long enough uh, to walk you through this. This is another uh, lecture by itself. But it shows the potential of the Borobudur to become not only a teaching tool, but a role model uh, in a world where so many young people adhere to violence. Why not uh, translate the program of the Borobudur into a teaching tool for compassion, for loving compassion? Uh, all this potential is here, and I mean, this is just to show you a few ideas of how this can be made in a way which is attractive to young people using multimedia. Uh, my time is almost running out, but I don't want to stop this presentation without a very important aspect uh, of the Borobudur. It has been noticed that within a circumference of 50 kilometers of the Borobudur, every major religion, Christianity, Islam, uh, Hinduism, all have uh, implemented major sanctuaries. And that's why this spot is so holy. And I would like, uh, in a time where we have all these conflicts in the world, shortly show this overall picture which uh, places uh, the Borobudur, the Buddhist worldview, in the center of these different uh, religious worldviews. And it's quite amazing to see that. The Borobudur, a place where man meets the divine within himself. Apparently, the Borobudur is located at the heart of a quite unique spiritual energy field of extreme intensity 
which has permitted each of the major religions present in Java to proliferate with quite unique accomplishments within a radius of some 50 kilometers from the temple. So let's look at Islam. Devout Muslims who replaced the Buddhists of central Java as the predominant religious majority have surrounded the ancient site of the Borobudur with a dense network of not less than 300 musholas, Muslim prayer rooms, and mosques. And places such as the Islamic school of Pondok Mabala have become a model for the propagation of enlightened and tolerant Islam. Not to speak of the Brotherhood's devout followers of the Prophet, which keep the flame of his faith alive around the temple. Or Christianity. Within only a few kilometers from the Borobudur, Christian and namely Catholic faith possesses in the little town of Muntilan, with its old Jesuit tradition, one of its most prolific centers, which has generated more bishops than any other city except Florence in Italy. And while a benevolent virgin attracts countless devout Catholic pilgrims to the miraculous source of Sedang Sona, Well, before concluding the program, let me say just one word about the experience to making such a large Buddhist project in an Islamic, in a Muslim country. Uh, I think it was and is quite amazing that uh, the largest Muslim nation in the world, Indonesia, financed this project and financed it obviously lavishly, uh, as you can see. I mean, they gave all the means to make a beautiful production. We spent four years. However, many people ask me now, uh, how can we buy this? How can we uh, uh, get this product? Uh, and here it's where it's becoming difficult. After the project was concluded, there was a management uh, change at the top of the Indo Indonesian government. And suddenly it was found, well, it cannot be the role of a Muslim country to propagate Buddhism. And basically uh, the promotion of the project was cut short and uh, it's not, I mean, you can buy it, but it's very difficult, it's not promoted. So I would like to make a suggestion uh, today. I've been asked by one of the venerables at lunch uh, what could be done uh, in this direction. And what I would love to see is, for instance, uh, to see an uh, independent Borobudur Foundation created, uh, which negotiates with the Indonesian government to have the right to promote uh, this as a tool uh, for promoting Buddhism. Uh, obviously, Indonesia would always get the credits for that, but I think uh, Borobudur Path to Enlightenment needs to be taken out and brought to the world because many universities in the West, uh, from Oxford to American universities, have come to me, University of Hawaii, they have come and said, how can we use this? And it was always kind of resisted by uh, Indonesia. So I think here is a wonderful forum to implement this seed uh, into the minds. Let's see if we can uh, find uh, the, the means and the possibilities to create an independent Borobudur foundation which could use this product to disseminate it. Let me conclude this presentation uh, with some sort of a beautiful prayer which is made every year by uh, Tibetan Lama, Lama Gangshan at the Borobudur, who does the famous fire ceremony and the candle lighting ceremony. And let's do it in the spirit, let's do this in the spirit of our beloved uh, king who has passed away uh, to conclude this.
Thank you very much. Thank you.